Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to our channel. Thanks for tuning in. This is the part two of our marriage series. And we're going to discuss finances. And mahar. We're going to just include that in the video too. Yeah, I think the mahar could go in finances appropriately. So as we begin our lesson, we'll do it with the tradition and with the uh, you know, seeking the, the blessings and the permission of Allah. So, Bismillah, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma salli wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa zwajihi wa man wala wa ba'd. First thing we're going to talk about is the mahab, and this is done like around the time of the wedding. So, the mahar is called the bride price, and this is what the wife is entitled to. It will not go towards the husband, neither the wali, so they should not have a say in what it is or uh, the amount it should be. The wali is the guardian of the woman, for people who don't know Arabic. Yes, wali is the guardian. So, yes. The mahar is the wife's bride, pri bride price. How is that distinct from a dowry? Well, the dowry is paid towards the men and different religious traditions but the mahar goes towards the wife. It's very interesting that in old uh, cultures from Europe to China, India, Africa, when people were trying to marry their daughter they would have to pay the family to accept their daughter because women were seen as a financial burden. But in Islam women are seen as an extremely important, beautiful and honored uh, creation of Allah and because of that the money doesn't transfer from the wife's family to the husband, nor does it transfer from the husband's family to the wife's family, but it is given directly to the wife, and it is her exclusive property. So she can set the limit on the mahars, and she sets the payment plan. So the wife can say she wants the mahar up front, or she can say you can pay it over five months, or you can start paying in the next two years or something along that line. So if the wife asks for the mahar up front and the husband did not pay it when she asks for it, then she has the right to annul the marriage. But if she did agree to, you know, give him a payment plan, tell him he doesn't have to pay it up front, then she cannot annul the marriage then. Now if the wife agrees to defer or delay the payment of the mahar and the husband becomes or never uh, becomes unable to pay it or he never becomes able to pay it then in that case it's not obligatory for him to pay it until and unless he's able to get the money if he is never able to get the money then it's not uh, a sin for him to not pay it however he must pay it if he is able and if she demands for it now this is unlike other things which we'll discuss such as the money the husband pays towards the wife for food and clothing. If he doesn't pay for these, then whether he's able to pay for it or not, it becomes a debt that he must pay. Good. And he'll be answerable for that on the Day of Judgment if he does not pay it. So that's it on Mahar, so now we're going to hop right into finances. And as we said in the last video, women do not need to provide financially, so this is all going to be covered on the husband expenses. That's his finances, what he's responsible for in the marriage. Mm -hmm. So the husband has to pay for five things, food, clothing, housing, medical, and then hygiene. When it comes to housing, what the husband will do is look at the status of the woman. So if the wife come from humble beginning small house and stuff then that's that is all the husband is obligated to pay just a small house but if the wife comes from a you know a big background a millionaire dad then he has to provide similar housing to what she's accustomed to and while we're on that topic housing if the wife is accustomed to having a servant prepare her meals or you know clean her food then the husband also has to provide a servant for her. Mm -hmm. Now one distinction between this and the others are the servant and the house never become the ownership of the wife. 
they're provided to the wife. In the case of clothing or food, it becomes the uh, property of the wife and she's able to do whatever she wants with it. And the next one is medical bills. I know we said, you know, the husband is in charge of the medical bills, but it's not all the bills, but just the bills that are concerned to the birthing of the husband's children. For example, if the woman got gestational diabetes during pregnancy, then the husband is responsible for buying all the medications and all those things that are needed to help her recover. But if the wife, you know, she just want braces or something, then he's not obligated to pay for that at all. And then the next thing is clothing. So the husband is obligated to provide the clothing that she's in need of and not the clothing that she's in want of. So <laughs> she needs a hijab, a dress, socks, coat for winter and stuff like that. He needs to provide those things for her. But if she sees a nice, you know, fancy bag, you know, luxury purse, she wants it, then he doesn't have to pay for that. Now, the food and the clothing are determined from what the husband can afford, in contrast to the housing and the servant, which is determined by um, what the wife status is accustomed to. So, when it comes to food next, the husband will be one of three things. He'll either be affluent, he will not be affluent, or he'll be somewhere between. So in the case of a husband who's affluent, he has to provide one liter of the staple grain of the area. If he's not affluent, it's 0.51 liters. And if he is in between, then it is 0.77 liters. Uh, what this equates to is about one loaf one and a half loaf and then two loaves of bread in the case of flour or rice obviously in the case uh, where rice is the staple grain it's interesting that from the beginning of time to now beginning of civilized uh, human living till now we have all of our food is based off of a grain every single meal you'll find is based off of a staple grain if you're in a flour based society it's always breads and pastas if you're in a rice-based society, it's always something that's uh, dishes which are based off of that. And then in addition to the staple grain, he must provide her uh, any comfortable condiments, oil, meat, cheese, vegetables, fruits, which are seasonal and customary in whatever area they live. Mm -hmm. And then this belongs to her. And one of the rights of the wife as well is to say that she doesn't want any of it for a day. And she'll instead take the money which, which she would have used to uh, buy those goods. And the last thing is hygiene. Is, is the last thing right? Mm -hmm. The last thing is hygiene. So what the husband is responsible for is, you know, providing soap, um, soap, deodorant, shampoo, oil, things to keep her, you know, keep her self tidy, sanitary napkins. But he's not responsible for like cosmetics. He don't have to buy her makeup. Uh, you know, luxury eye cream, something like that to keep you young and fresh. <laughs> he does have to pay for, you know, the minimum things. To well, you need to pay for the things that will keep you clean and healthy. Yes. <laughs> Not necessarily um, everything which can go beyond that, which would be an endless list, really. Mm -hmm. um, but a disclaimer, when it comes to discussing the law, we're not discussing what Islam teaches. We're discussing what Islam has as a law. So a law is the bare minimum. For example, um, it's defining what a crime would be, or uh, you know, or for example, murder. It's not saying that you just don't murder someone. <laughs> That's the minimum. And if you cross that line, then of course there's redress. So. Um, the husband would provide much more than the minimum, just as the wife would provide much more than the minimum. But when that threshold is crossed, then it becomes an issue where uh, either party would be able to seek redress or a right for the wrong which was done. Mm -hmm. So don't take this as a uh, as a plan, <laughs> you, you know, know on how you're supposed to, to behave. Minimum, yeah. You don't have to just do the minimum you're supposed to do much more than the minimum.
So a few things that we should know when the husband is not obligated to pay for the wife. You know, I don't really want to say, but I need to be fair. <laughs> so here are the, here's the first one. When the wife is in ihram for Hajj or Umrah, then he does not need to provide for her. And if she is being rebellious, she's not listening to him, then he doesn't have to provide for her. Which I think is kind of fair, you know, if you're not doing anything for him. You know, he's not your slave, so he doesn't have to, you know, provide for you. And then the third thing is, um, if she leaves the house without his permission. So, you know, he told her, you can't go to the movies. We have to go with my mom. Then she said, no, I'm going to the movies no matter what. I'm going to meet up with my friends. I'm going. <laughs> and then she leaves. Then he does not have to provide for her. And while I'm on this one, here's another example. The wife told the husband that um, he does not have to pay the mahar immediately. And then she wants to go to the movies. And he said, no, please stay home. You know, we need to eat food or something like that. She, be, she can't be like, um, you still only $500 of the mahar. I'm annulling this marriage and going where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> and going where I'm going. She cannot do that either. And then the last thing is, let's see. Uh, she fasts without his permission. Do you want to explain that? Um, well, there's a hadith which came down regarding that. So it's the voluntary fasts. Um, Rasulullah wasallam has related a hadith about that. So, of course, we, we know from there case closed um, but maybe from my own thinking you know I think it might be related to uh, when someone is fasting there can be all kinds of issues such as uh, a husband would be shy to ask his wife to cook something if she's fasting so then he's kind of fasting as well perhaps but Allahu A'lam and Mr. Nalko has right of intimacy full stop full stop <laughs> yeah. so, so um, now there are some financial obligations which apply to both men and women so when it comes to your ancestors and your descendants, these financial obligations apply to both men and women. So whenever a, a man or woman has the finances to pay for it, then their ancestors and their descendants, not meaning their aunts and uncles, but just their father and their mother, and then the lineage that goes up like that, their father and mother, and so on. And your children, and then so on, grandchildren and such, not counting um, nieces and nephews or something like this so the obligation would be first upon providing for your mother and then providing for your father and then providing for your children who are still small and then providing for your children who are older so the definition here is based off of being a kabir and in uh, colloquial Arabic kabir can mean someone as old as 30 35 even uh, but in uh, fiqh the, the term Kabir is referring to the age of discernment, which occurs at the age of seven. So a small child would be someone who is between, uh, you know, just created to six years. And then from seven years until puberty, someone would be considered a big kid. In I guess, uh, English colloquial uh, uh, way of saying things would be a big kid. So first you have to provide for your little, little kids and then your big kids in that order if you don't have enough money for all. And this is an obligation for the wife as well as for the husband, only if there is excess. Now, the definition of excess here is referring to money after you provide for the husband and wife, even if it means you have to sell something. Now, the what do you have to sell or not sell? Maybe that can be another video when I go into a slightly more uh, advanced fiqh for economics. But basically, it's the same things you would sell if you owed a debt. And uh, people who are familiar with Western law will know you know, if you have a debt, there are certain things which they can take from you, the court can take from you, and other things which the court cannot take from you. It's basically what you need and what you don't need. Mm -hmm. um, even if you own a house, you might have to sell your house to pay these obligations because you don't need to own a house. You can easily rent. Same thing with a car and other things like this. So uh, one of the lists in there as well that you have to provide for is um, getting married. Getting married, so the mahar. So in the case where your father is in need of marriage, which we defined in the last episode. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, 
the daughter or son or granddaughter, grandson or father. So remember, it goes, the lineage goes uh, for your ancestors and for your posterity. So in the case where he is in need of marriage, then that obligation would fall on his family. So in the case where someone's father is in need of marriage, uh, I, for example, if my father was in need of marriage and he was a Muslim, I would be obligated to arrange a marriage for him and pay the mahar so that he could be married. And this falls under the hukum shari, the legal ruling of the necessity of protecting your family against sin. Thanks for tuning in. I hope uh, the lesson was of some benefit, inshallah. Be sure to tune in next week where we're going to talk about something a bit more juicier and that is polygamy and the rights <laughs> between the wives slash wives. Juicier? Juicy. Anyways, assalamu alaikum. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.